we are accustomed to our own technology and find it difficult to recognize that the ancients may have had sophisticated technology of their own. Since the technology of the ancients is not obvious to us, are we looking in the wrong place? Could it be they had power systems, but they were entirely different from ours today? Looking at the architecture of structures from ancient Egypt stimulates a sense of wonder. Clearly, Egyptian monuments rival the grandeur of our most modern buildings today. Yet we are taught to believe that we are the ones with knowledge of high technology, something the ancients could not possibly have had. As long as we think that the ancients weren't able to use high technology, then we're not looking for it. And yet, the evidence is right in front of our eyes. We find megalithic sites everywhere around the world. So there's certain things in common that they all seem to know, and we don't know it. Yeah, a lot of people are trying to figure out why mankind built these structures out of these huge megalithic stones. We don't even know how to move uh, 200, 300 ton stones very well today, let alone four or 5,000 years ago. I started looking at megalithic structures from an electromagnetic point of view. And sure enough, I began to find that there, there were these energies there present in measurable forces. Strange things happen sometimes in sacred sites. And those are clues that the physics that we're taught in school is not everything. For thousands of years, the pyramids and the Sphinx stood as sentinels on the open desert. Yet, in recent years, a 20-mile wall, 14 feet high, was installed around the enormous site of the Giza Plateau. There are about a hundred armed guards patrolling the pyramids at night. Applications for investigative academic research, while entertained initially, are almost all routinely refused. Unlike in times past, tourists are now being restricted from taking photographs in the Egyptian museum. The monuments of Egypt are world heritage sites why is access and legitimate scientific research being systematically restricted? Much of ancient Egypt remains undiscovered. Satellite images show traces of buried structures that are still not excavated. In the name of protecting sites, are Egyptian authorities preventing us from learning the truth about our ancient past? Despite strict regulations on what kind of research is allowed, there is still an extraordinary amount of evidence that shows that the ancient Egyptians had knowledge that has been lost. We don't have the technology to build the pyramids now. Not even close. We're not the most evolved we've ever been. And that is one of the blinders that has stopped us from imagining that the ancients could have been far smarter than us. 
Hakim Awiang was raised by indigenous elders who lived in the area of the Band of Peace. Having preserved the ancient Sioux language, stories were passed down generation after generation. Fragments of knowledge from the ancient past were thus preserved. If my colleague, the, the, the scholar, who learned to say that the Egyptians have a piece of rope put it around a block of stone, at least 60 ton weight, and pull and push by animals and run on wooden blocks, this is what the scholars are saying. We may never be exactly sure how the pyramids were built, Yet, we can begin to reconstruct our understanding of the culture living in the Golden Age and their values. Traditional Egyptology insists that the pyramids were built by slaves to feed the egos of kings. Does this fit with our emerging construct of Egypt in a Golden Age? There is no slavery. All workers are willingly Pyramids builder. This is a qualified people of architecture, uh, engineers, and they deal with all the power, like cutting stones, transfer it and use it. And that is clear, and not only in the pyramids and the pyramids and in the temple walls and uh, and many places you can see that clearly. There are clues throughout Egypt that point to knowledge of high technology. A fascinating thing occurred when a chunk of stone recently fell off a lintel at Abydos Temple, and controversial images resembling a helicopter and other advanced-looking vehicles were revealed under the stone. It would seem that the images were covered in the distant past when things were changing politically in Egypt. Nowadays, Egyptian tour guides are explicitly instructed not to point these out to tourists. The Egyptological explanation is that it is multiple hieroglyphs overlapping from distant king's inscriptions. But, like many things in Egypt, the explanation is still debatable. Another controversial object that Egyptologists merely deem impossible is the artifact commonly known as the Baghdad battery that generates a mild electrical charge. Similar ancient artifacts that match these objects have been found in Egypt. We can't say for certain, but it would appear that the Egyptians documented the existence of these artifacts as well. Recreations of these objects have been made and have successfully created electric current. Also noteworthy are strange representations of objects that resemble light bulbs found in the crypts at Dendera. There was no natural light inside these underground crypts, but we see no soot from torches or oil lamps, the only lights we know the ancients used. Could the ancient Egyptians have had their own source of electrical power? If nothing else, the ancients had to cut, move and lift massive stone blocks that would challenge our engineers today. What was their secret? We automatically assume that ancient structures are for ceremonial and religious purposes. Maybe the pyramids served a completely different function than previously imagined. There's been lots of speculation about what the pyramids were actually built for. The most accepted notion is that they were tombs. Much more complicated situation with the Great Pyramid than most people understand or most people believe, including a lot of Egyptologists who see it simply as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu. That idea is childish for, for the following reason. I mean, it's obvious we don't find mummies in the pyramids. And of course, 
not finding a single mummy in any of the pyramids uh, doesn't seem to deter the people who think that that's what they were for. Yes, there's something that's sometimes referred to as a stone sarcophagus or copper in it, a beautiful granite structure, um, but that doesn't prove definitively in my mind that it was ever actually used for a tomb. It may have been used for many other purposes. Pyramids were built not as a tomb. There are some pyramids built in a different construction, like the one in Saqqara, steep pyramid, that is tomb. Look at the obvious difference in construction between the step pyramid and the great pyramid. The difference in style of construction would logically indicate they were built in different time frames. The buildings we know to be tombs, like the step pyramid at Saqqara and the flat-topped mastabas also at Saqqara, are very different from the smooth-sided pyramids at Giza and Dashur. Typically in Egypt, older constructions are built of larger stones. New constructions are built of smaller stones. Also in archaeology, older structures are deeper. Newer structures are found closer to the surface. Every other tomb that has been found is highly decorated with names of the occupant. The inside of these pyramids seems solely functional and not decorative at all. But if we stop all together and say, okay, if they weren't tombs, what were they? What are the biggest structures that modern man builds on the planet? The biggest, most awe-inspiring structures we create are hydroelectric dams. Why are we willing to invest such awe-inspiring amounts of labor and effort in constructing those? Because we know we're going to get a very valuable physical return in the form of electricity. And by comparison, I wonder if the ancient megalith builders weren't willing to invest such staggering amounts of resources by even smaller populations because they knew that they could get something very physical and worthwhile back from it. People are fascinated by Egyptian monuments, and some report the energy is palpable at these sites. Is it possible to confirm this energy through scientific means? What I've been finding in the last 20 years of research is a lot of experiments have been done that show that there's a certain type of energy that does not exist in our current science. It's unknown to our current science. Uh, we call it subtle energy. Well, this is a whole new uh, trend of thought in looking at ancient structures that maybe the ancients understood subtle energies. So this appears to be a technology that may have existed in megalithic societies. You know, they, the, these, these societies that built things out of big stones. It makes sense that you could motivate an entire population to invest so heavily in building these structures, I think. And I'm, I don't mean to say by any means that this is the only purpose of the megaliths, but I think it's pretty clear that it's at least one of the primary or one of the important purposes for building these structures. We find megalithic sites everywhere around the world, and there's a tendency to, to make circles or certain types of formations. Megalithic sites occur all over the world. Is their placement random? Or does the location of these sites reveal yet another hidden layer of ancient knowledge? One thing I found looking at uh, different megalithic structures over a few continents and in numerous places around the world, overwhelmingly these places, the pyramids, the stonehenges, etc. of the world, were placed on ground where an unusual type of geology naturally concentrates the regular daily natural electromagnetic fluctuations that occur everywhere on the earth each day. You go into England, for example, um, the, the ley lines that cross uh, England, the Michael line, which is hundreds of miles long that crosses England, um, that carries this energy along that line. It will therefore generate 
uh, electric currents in the land called telluric currents in the straight geological sense of that word. And um, those occur everywhere on the planet. But we know that this delay energy, this subtle energy passes along these lines. There are certain special types of geology that will magnify those several fold. And that's where we found the megalith builders preferred to put their, uh, their monuments. And typically where lines cross, where you get more than one line intersecting, uh, temples were often built. These are called conductivity discontinuities, which sounds highly technical, but it's merely the place where one area of ground that has a, a good ability to conduct electricity meets another area of ground that has a lesser ability to conduct these natural electric currents. The Chinese had the same tradition. They call them dragon lines. It was illegal for a commoner to be buried on such a line. A king had to be buried on such a line. They put palaces there. There's a whole series of sacred sites that are always built on lines like this. I want to say in this area about the uh, location of temples. You have to have a, a symbols appear on the ground. When it's uh, uh, seen, then this is the place where people naturally come to get more uh, healthy energy from that spot, you know, energy pops from the earth. And it appears as though they were attempting to control the flow of this energy and use it for their own purposes. The key hours, unfortunately, are the pre-dawn hours. If you really want to study this, you've got to get up at three and get out there very fast. Um, that's because the, uh, the energy that is involved in these sites, that's really fueling most of it, originates with the daily changes in the Earth's geomagnetic field. Uh, it's strongest during the day, weakest at night. And in the hours leading up to dawn, the weaker field lines now come roaring back to closer to full strength very quick. It's the most dramatic time in terms of change of magnetic strength per hour. It's the most dramatic time of the day. And wherever you have uh, a changing magnetic field occurring, you, you are generating uh, electric current in anything present that will conduct electricity. It's a simple principle of physics known as induction, and it, it's a universal. Normally, in everyday life, we don't ever see large concentrations of this energy. Normally, it'll show up at, let's say, at mountaintops, at sacred sites. You'll feel a certain calm, a certain peace. Sometimes people in those places uh, report mystical experiences. They'll see into some other dimension, okay? They'll see into some other time. The Chinese have known about this for a long time, and they call it qi. The Hindus, in their ancient texts call it prana and the yogis with the maintain a very ancient tradition um, use it. It affects a, a variety of different processes. Electricity magnetism has a strong effect on that so it modifies all the other laws of physics. When you look back on how sacred sites were chosen and uh, buildings like the pyramids were, were constructed, the suspicion arises that they understood quite a bit more about this stuff than we do, and they may have been using it in their engineering. Then the megalith builders designed these structures and, and then built them in such a way as to further concentrate those energies. So they definitely seemed to have known what they were doing. We are not used to things built out of stone being high technology. It is clear that several different kinds of stone from a variety of sources were used to construct Egyptian monuments. Did the distinct qualities of the stones serve a special purpose? 
What I do find fascinating is that the core of the pyramids, at least at Giza, are made out of one type of limestone. Now it is the limestone that was closest, but it also happens to be the type that's called dolomite because it's got a high magnesium content. And because of that metal content, that kind of limestone conducts electricity pretty well. And then they chose to sheath the pyramid in the uh, wider Tura limestone, which, granted, it's wider and it's prettier and all that, but it also has almost zero um, uh, magnesium content. And therefore, it's a much poorer conductor of electricity. It's closer to a pure calcium carbonate, which is what all limestone is. And pure calcium carbonate conducts electricity much more poorly than dolomite does. It's interesting to me that those outer stones were the ones that they cut so precisely that all these thousands of years later you still can't get a razor blade between them. Because basically what we've got here is we've got a situation with a highly electrically conductive core of those pyramids wrapped in what is effectively a, v a very effective insulator. Why the granite in the passageways, you know? And, it, and so of course I'm thinking from an electrical point of view, and a physical point of view, is there anything special about granite? And, and yeah, there is. Granite is slightly radioactive, and it will ionize or electrify the air. Uh, it releases radon gas, which is radioactive. Granite is a transmission stone. It's not dead stone, it's alive. So you have these sealed shafts with granite linings, and I wonder if it wasn't designed to keep an electrical charge present in those shafts. They were built exactly like, if you will, an insulated wire, only more so because you've got all the charge in the ground that's spread across the base, concentrated all the way up into this tiny spot at the top. We find similarities in three different constructions. The one at Giza here, Valley Temple, and one at Abydos, and another one abroad in England, the Stonehenge. Uh, same material being constructed with, and same way and same technique. But the construction there, it's built in addition to have the water, because it's water bed. It's a huge water bed, and it's still working, still producing water. In Egypt, you do have a similar situation to England in that you have limestone aquifers under the monuments. An aquifer is an underground layer of porous, water-bearing rock. Water flows through the aquifers as rainfall, or when rivers and lakes flood, the water drains into them and movement of water through limestone or chalk aquifers is known to produce electrical charge by two different processes that are self-reinforcing. And I've personally measured this for a week at a stretch at Silbury Hill in England, for example, right before and after thunderstorms as the water is sinking into the ground, we measured the increase in ground current, the change in the magnetic field as that happened, etc. And in Egypt, you had the Nile crashing, you know, dropping every year and then flooding again. And uh, that movement of water up and down through the layers of limestone would generate electrical charge. Flowing water generates a, a, at least a mild electrical charge, which means it generates an electric current, which means it generates a magnetic field as well. So if you were looking to give an electrical charge, a little boost to say a mound or something like that, it makes a lot of sense to have it at a minimum running water. And in fact, at uh, Tiwanaku on the south shore of Lake Titicaca, their biggest monument, the Akapana Pyramid, uh, was was terraced in such a way as to have in, uh, the water come down in waterfalls that alternated outside the pyramid, inside the pyramid. But th that kind of falling water generates enough electric charge that one of the common school physics experiments is you can in your own sink at home, if you can divide the stream of water coming out of your faucet into two separate streams, you can take a, a little LED indicator light and put it between the streams and it'll generate enough electricity that maybe every 20 seconds or so the, the light bulb will come on.
Uh, and then the question is, did some of those layers of limestone uh, run up the Giza plateau? And they did, and, and they did you know, come up uh, to the surface underneath where some of the pyramids are located. The idea would be that, that it would be the rising and falling of the Nile that would produce this electric ground current uh, by moving through the different layers of the limestone aquifer. And when there was a dip, say, in that supply, maybe that's when the uh, ionized air in the granite shafts and galleries could help keep the process going, if you will. I tend to wonder if the electrified shafts might not have been able to act in a similar fashion to your car battery when you come to a stoplight. Normally your battery is not being used when you're driving your car, the alternator provides all the juice, but when you stop and that alternator is turning very weakly, that's when you want the battery there to keep everything going so your engine doesn't cut out. So you've got this concentration of negative charge from the ground at the peak of the pyramid or mound and a concentration of positive charge above it. And if those two become strong enough, you can start to get brush discharge, which would mean it would glow like uh, ball lightning, for example. It's a theory. Why in the Great Pyramid is there no frescoes, there's nothing, no decorations at all. Now, some people have proposed the idea that the pyramids are actually energy machines. And so I liken this to the fact like you wouldn't put a decoration inside your oven. I was talking with a woman who had spent some time in the Great Pyramid, and her comment was, it felt like I was in a machine. She said it, it was not like this, oh, it's a wonderful shrine. She said it felt very functional. In fact, she made a comment that I actually think is probably right on. She said, I felt as if I wouldn't have wanted to be in here when it was right. Invisible, subtle energy occurs around us all the time and is measurable by science. We had noticed a lot of people showing us photographs from megalithic sites that disproportionately often seem to have these balls of light in there, uh, usually flash photos. Orbs are often written off as dust or other particles in the air, but that does not change the fact that they seem to occur more often in particular places at particular times. At Tikal, at the top of the most energetic pyramid that we found down there, uh, we took a lot of flash photos during the course of our eight-hour stakeouts, which would run from roughly 3 a.m. till 11 a.m. And on the pyramids that were electrically dead, that had no juice, nothing going on, which were the big fancy ones, but the, the most recently built ones, uh, there we would take photos and find out eventually when they were developed, no orbs, no glowing balls of light. But on the oldest pyramid down there where we did work and got all kinds of results that was 1,200 years older than the big fancier ones, uh, in that case the, the photography we got back from our own simple flash cameras, uh, they were literally choking the screen with these balls at the period at which the air had it was highest in electrical charge. And on that, on the, the strongest day down there, I was recording electrical charge higher than I've recorded even in thunderstorms back home. We don't know what orbs are, but we, our personal guess is that they're bowls of ionized or electrified air that will tend to hang together. Uh, a good analogy would be ball lightning where it's simply so electrified that it, the molecules are excited enough to glow. Other evidence shows that there is energy occurring naturally everywhere on the planet that our science knows about but seems to ignore. Nikola Tesla sought to provide the world with free wireless electricity for everybody on Earth. He discovered that electricity occurred naturally throughout the Earth's atmosphere and ground. The telluric currents in the ground that John Burke discussed 
and the electricity present in the ionosphere in the atmosphere, which is ionized by the sun, he also created and developed ways to harness those energies. Tesla, who teach Nikola Tesla to get to that power of electricity? And he, 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 he didn't invent it, it's already there, but he know how to use it. And not only that, he did not take an advantage like Mr. Edison. Tesla wanted to harness the natural energy that exists everywhere on Earth and make it free to the public. Edison endeavored to produce and distribute electricity by creating a regulated monopoly for profit. He became rich and the people more light into their home. Yeah, so Nikola Tesla, he's the one uh, think of how to use this energy. Between 1901 and 1917, the Tesla Tower was built on Long Island as a wireless broadcasting system for telephone and electrical signals. Interestingly, it was constructed on an aquifer with descending passageways and tunnels beneath it. At the time, few understood how it worked. Tesla's funding was ultimately dropped by J.P. Morgan because Tesla wanted the wireless electricity to be free and therefore J.P. Morgan couldn't make a profit. So even though Tesla's genius was seen by many, he was still driven into obscurity. The energy to create free wireless energy has always existed on our planet and still exists today. And it's not the only energy on our planet, there are plenty. Rivers are flow by energy. Uh, tsunami is energy. Frequencies are energy. If we have the electricity now, it's based on explosion energy. Now, the sound energy based on a technology different from the explosion energy, and it's known as implosion energy. This energy was not the kind of energy that we have that pollutes. It was a completely um, passive energy that had no byproducts. The energy we use today is generated by combustion and is non-renewable. It is called explosion energy and leaves exhaust and pollution. Our system all over the planet today is based on the explosion energy. That's why the petrol is too expensive. <laughs> In contrast, Implosion energy, like solar panels and wind power, is clean and renewable. We are beginning to realize that we need sustainable energy. Implosion energy, very simple. All what you need is the beam of the sun on a running water. Not just running in a straight line, but in a zigzag. And that's, you find that all the tunnels are in a zigzag form for such a purpose. In addition to the limestone aquifers underneath the pyramids, there is evidence of a network of man-made tunnels. As a boy, when I'm living in my house, which is a few hundred yards away from the nose of what we call the Sphinx Tefnuti, uh, this was my playing yard, and I, I know uh, tunnels. I walked in these tunnels, I swim in these tunnels, I crawl in these tunnels. And I know that this is uh, one way of uh, creating energy. Now this is cost nothing. I mean, all what you need is a beam of the sun reaching the running water underneath the tunnel. And you can see that there are many openers in each tunnel permit this be sun beam reach the water. And when it does, then the energy is there. Energy is not, not just to run your car or it's run, run the people, feed the people. If the pyramid fields of the Band of Peace and the network of underground tunnels are still there, why don't they generate energy the way they used to?
In the condition of the pyramids now, stripped of those smooth insulating outer casings, it's going to leak electrical air about as well as, you, as a car radiator radiates heat. I mean, it's almost perfectly designed to weaken that. And yet still you get these uh, reports of people like Siemens, who was one of the pioneers of electricity. And in, uh, he's an Englishman. There's even a unit of electrical, I believe, resistance named after him called the Siemens. Uh, he was on top of the Great Pyramid, I think, during the 1880s. And they began to notice that when his Arab guide stood up and spread his fingers, they'd hear a ringing. And um, when he closed them, you wouldn't. And he stood up, and I guess, he, he, he could sense the literal electricity in the air. And on the spot, he um, improvised a, 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 an instant Leyden jar, which is one of the earliest things they used to use to store electric charge. And he did it by opening a wine bottle, wetting some newspaper, wrapping the wet newspaper around the glass wine bottle, and holding the wine bottle up above his head until sparks started to issue from the wine bottle. And at that point, his Arab guides started calling, uh, accusing him of things like witchcraft. They got into a physical struggle, and he accidentally touched one of the guides with the charged wine bottle, and it knocked the man to the ground and, and unconscious for a short period, after which they took off down the pyramid. But there was, in other words, a professional scientist familiar with electricity and its rudimentary but accurate forms, uh, sensing exactly that, even in this ruined condition that the pyramid's in today, yeah. If you come to the Egyptian Museum, there is an item over there known as the schist disc, found by Dr. Walter Emery, and he said, or he think that it's a, it could be a vase for a lotus flower. No. The schist disc was found at Saqqara in a burial chamber that no one is allowed to visit. Other goods found in the chamber were simple ropes, pottery, and grains. The disc shows clear evidence of sophisticated technology in the way it was built and it seems out of context with the rest of the grave goods. Is this the original context for this artifact? Or is it possible that it has had a long journey over the last several millennia, and this just happened to be its final resting place? Look at this hollow stone tube. It looks as though the schist disc could fit over it, it would take sophisticated instruments to shape the tube so precisely. How did they do it? Uh, to, to cut the stone. This is by, by a sonic uh, a cut with uh, no metal uh, instruments like a bronze chisel or this. No, it's another stone. And uh, th this other stone, it's a hard, the hardest stone you can find, which is the diamond. There are pieces of stone lying around that show concave shapes that actually have the machine tooling marks on it. The evidence of the high technology is right in front of us. Look again at these quartz objects. Aside from their unique and amazing shapes, could they have had another purpose? Today, quartz crystal is used as the basis of all kinds of modern technology. It is most commonly used in crystal oscillators. Technology uses oscillating frequencies from tiny quartz crystals that vibrate at certain speeds, with a signature vibration for each device. AM, FM radios, CDs and DVDs, computer processors and Ethernet rely on quartz crystals. Could it be that the ancients were tapping into this technology and using it on a much larger scale in a way we can only begin to imagine? Of course, we can't say for certain, but based on what we've seen, we can theorize. Energy can be created and manipulated in many ways. It is the lifeblood of a civilization and therefore an important resource. In Egypt, there are 67 constructions all along the Nile like sails. And if for uh, those who has 
the eye, they can tell uh, from the shape of that construction. The straight uh, form of angles, that is a pyramid or a construction for energy, a, pl a plant for energy. That's what we have. A theory that's always struck me, that they were, they were intended actually to somehow or another spiritualize the whole civilization. In other words, to provide a widespread, high level of energy that people needed because a descending age was upon them. And I believe what the pyramid and other cer certain other structures were constructed for was to basically act as a kind of a, the equivalent of a street light. You know, if you're in a neighborhood that's maybe not the nicest, nicest neighborhood and, the, you know, it gets dark at night, you like to have bright lights go on. And that's effectively what the Great Pyramid was. Now, these were not lights that uh, illuminated it so that people could see where they were going. It was basically a, a device, a generator for, if you will, broadcasting and transmitting throughout the planetary structure a type of field which uplifted the entire humanity. And maybe those pyramids were built in some sense or another to, to stay the decline. Let's call them in some sense or another spiritual granaries designed to somehow store an emotional or spiritual or psychological or some sort of energy that was needed to keep people from becoming the total barbarians that they subsequently became. We had the ability to basically prop up humanity for a while using the system, but what we saw was the, the street light eventually went out. The original knowledge got lost and the later builders were building them out of ego. They were monuments to the king, if you will, but they were no longer engines that could help feed their people. Catastrophes around the world damaged or, if you will, decommissioned some of these uh, sites. So some of them went offline, just like a power plant going offline. I tend to wonder if the few people who knew the secrets to the energy connection with those pyramids didn't die off. If it was a thin chain of, for example, a shaman to his apprentice, and if the wrong people get killed at the right time, that chain is broken, that knowledge gets lost. As long as we think we are more advanced than we've ever been, we are blind to technology based on subtle energies. It's not fair also. It's not fair to deny what you can see and touch by your own hand. This is all needed, the technique, and we have that technique still. But nobody uh, wants to listen. 